our next speaker probably has the coolest title in all of academia. He is the Deep Mind Professor of Machine Learning at the University of Cambridge. Deep Mind, that is pretty cool. And he's here to talk about his specialty today, machine learning. So, please give a warm, Starmus welcome to Neil Lawrence. I want to be the second deep mind professor. Kind of bad to be going after one astronaut, let alone two. <laughs> But I thought I'd take you back into space to start. Because although I'm not an astronaut, I can ask the question, why did we go into space? And I'm sure there's many answers. But the answer I want to give today is associated with this photograph. We've seen a lot of pictures of the Earth from space across Starmus Earth. That's perhaps not surprising. But this one's special because it was taken by Apollo 17 in December 1972. It's known as the Blue Marble, and it's the first full-frame picture of the full Earth taken from space. And it became a symbol of the emerging environmental movement. Because by standing in space, and looking back at the Earth, we could finally start to ask questions about what it meant to be living on such a fragile planet, living in the vastness of space. Now, what's that got to do with the subject of my talk, artificial intelligence? I believe we can use artificial intelligence to provide exactly the same role. This picture is from Apollo 11. It's Eagle returning to Columbia from the lunar surface, taken by Michael Collins with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on that craft. Sometimes said of this photo, it's a photo of everyone, every living human in the universe, apart from Michael Collins. One of the things about this photo is you see hanging off Eagle, the lunar landing module, its radar pointing at Columbia. Eagle is using that radar to rendezvous with Columbia. And that process is taking place automatically. We've heard from two extraordinary astronauts. And these astronauts do extraordinary things in space. But they cannot do these things without working with machines. Armstrong chose to land Eagle on the moon manually. But to do so, he fed commands to a computer, which interpreted those commands and placed him down in the sea of tranquility. The computer could have landed Eagle on its own. Armstrong chose to land Eagle manually because he'd seen a boulder field in the area that it was targeting. So what we see here is a collaboration between human being and machine. One where the machine could do the bits it was best at, but the human was left in charge to choose some of the most critical decisions. That collaboration is occurring less than 40 years after this event. To give you a sense of that event, we just heard from Catherine Thornton about an event that occurred more than 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Only 30 years ago, she was up there fixing the Hubble Space Telescope. But when Amelia Earhart landed the little red bus in Londonderry, being the first, the second ever person to cross the Atlantic solo, it was 1932, only less than 40 years before we would land on the moon. 
The extraordinary thing here is, of course, Amelia flew that flight with very little machine aid in her navigation. In fact, she even lost her altimeter early on in the flight. She flew through a storm. She had flames emerging from the exhaust manifold of her plane. She flew 2,000 miles through dead reckoning. All of that work was done later by machines, aided by computers. And the groundwork for that collaboration was laid by these people. These are the test pilots of the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, one of the founding entities of NASA, who flew throughout the Second World War to characterize and understand how planes were responding to pilot input, to do what we heard Lord Kelvin told us we need to do. To improve things, we need to measure them. We need to put numbers on them. Until Bob Gilruth, who led NACA at the time, characterized the feel of an aircraft, we couldn't improve the feel of an aircraft because we didn't have numbers to characterize what that feel meant. What's that got to do with anything involving AI? Well, this interaction between machine and human is at the heart of what I want to talk about. Because what I'm going to talk to you about today is a notion I call the atomic human. So that's also the subject of an upcoming book that's released June the 6th. But the notion of the atomic human is the following. If each time that the machine did something that we used to think of as uniquely human, did something that Amelia Earhart did as she navigated, and we handed that across to Kármán filters and radars as the uh, Apollo 11 mission flew to the moon. If that's cutting something away from us, if that's taking something from us, if, if computers can beat us at chess, if computers can write Shakespearean poetry better than any of us, this is like a cutting process. Now, the original notion of the atom, not the modern physics notion, comes from the Greeks, who asked the question, if I cut into physical matter, and I cut once, I take one half, I cut again, and I continue this process of cutting, is there a moment at which I can't cut? Or can this process go on forever? Now, the Greek atomists said, there is a moment at which I can't cut. And they called it atomos, or atom, indivisible in Greek. The notion of the atomic human is the same for humans. Is there a moment at which the machine can no longer take away our capabilities? And if we find what that moment is, does that tell us something about the essence of humanity? So in the same way that Apollo 17 was looking back at the Earth, telling us something about our fragility, we can use the machine to look at ourselves and understand what is precious about us. Now, you can come up with your own answers for that question. Um, I'm going to share with you the answers I came up with for the book. So this is the Colossus computer that was also developed in the Second World War and was used for decoding high command codes for the German armed forces. It's the first digital programmable computer. And from the very start, the computer was able to process information at a very fast rate. Here, it's being processed on paper tapes, which are spinning very fast as the machine digests the information. It's absorbing information far faster than any human would have been capable of, which was why we had to use it. In fact, early computers were called automatic computers because they were replacing human computers who, was doing the process, who were doing the process automatically uh, by hand. So I want to focus on this notion of communication and particular communication rates. So if I stand here communicating with you at a reasonable public speaking rate, I'm communicating with you at around about 2,000 bits of information per minute. Now, a bit of information is the same amount of information as you would get if I were to toss a coin and share the answer with you. Or if I were to give you the result of a tennis match, which had started on evens. So I'm sharing with you about 2,000 bits of information per minute. Now, information was defined in this way by Claude Shannon who cleverly separated the notion of information from its context. So it doesn't matter what that information is about, but there's a limit on the amount of information I can share. In comparison, 
machines share information with each other at billions of bits per minute. They do this because they use the speed of light to share information, which is about a million times faster than the speed of sound that I'm using to share information with you. They also have well-written codes, which means overall they turn out to be about 300 million times faster than us in terms of communication. So just to give you a sense of what that means, imagine your salary is $2,000 a month. $2,000 a month is not a large amount of money, but it's an amount that a lot of uh, people live on. The computer's salary is $600 billion a month. It is vastly ahead of us in terms of its ability to communicate and absorb information. So to the extent that the computer will outstrip us, it has done so years ago. And it has done so to an order of magnitude in ways that I think is very difficult for human beings to imagine. It's a very, very different form of intelligence. Now, having said that, the computer and humans are both doing calculations. And if we look at how many calculations a computer is doing, it's doing trillions of calculations per second. Whereas the average human being, in order to process all the information in all the neurons that are firing in your brain at the moment, is actually typically doing much more calculation than a typical computer. So around a billion, billion calculations per second is what we estimate it would take to simulate the human brain. So when you think about your brain, you have a brain that is powerful like a Formula One engine, but your ability to deliver that power is limited. It's like you've got a Formula One car with bicycle wheels. You can't deploy that power on the track. Conversely, the machine is much lower powered, but it's like a go-kart. It can deploy its power in a different way and run rings around us in ways that are beyond our intelligence because it's operating in ways that are not the ways that human operate, humans operate. I sometimes summarize this in terms of what I call the embodiment factor. And the embodiment factor is the following notion. Imagine a computer did try to share one second's worth of communication. Once one second's worth of its calculations. So a computer calculates for one second, and then it tries to share every calculation that is done with a fellow computer. It would take that machine about 20 minutes to share all the calculations it can do in one second. If we do the same calculation for the human, it would take you 15 billion years to share all the processing you're doing in your head, if you could access it, with another human being from just one second of processing. This means our intelligence is fundamentally different from the machines, and it always has been. It's locked in. We have an enormous number of thoughts, but we can't share those thoughts with other people because we have a limited ability to communicate. This, of course, is occurring because we think at light speed using neurons which use electricity, but we can only communicate with the speed of sound. Now, what's remarkable about human intelligence is how we overcome that bandwidth limitation. So, across recent years, we've seen large transformations in the way we deal with data. So if we go back 100 years ago, what we find is when humans looked at data, they could misinterpret it. They could look at the data and overinterpret the data. We had to invent fields of classical statistics to stop us misunderstanding numbers. And most of the work we do around data today, such as producing uh, phase three drug trials to produce new medicines, we test the numbers using techniques from classical statistics to stop ourselves being fooled. The reason we do that is because when we use this narrow bandwidth channel in practice, we tend to overinterpret the amount of information we receive. What we're faced with now, with the advent of the digital age, and this has been true for two decades already, so you're basically feeling the effects of this as we speak, is a world where the computer has an enormously high bandwidth connection with data, and maintains that low bandwidth connection with us. So this offers new approaches for manipulation that sit with the computer, which are not the approaches of manipulation of persuasion that one human might use on another, but just the sort of things that social media companies do, presenting information that is known to engage people because it confirms their existing beliefs, or presenting misinformation that will engage people because it, uh, it 
fits with their existing beliefs. So this has been, for the last 20 years, something many of my colleagues and I have been working on, this emerging field of data science. How do we go from a world where the computer is sitting between us and data and offering all these potentials for misinformation to a world where we're back in control as we are with classical statistics? Underlying that challenge of working through this low information bandwidth is this following problem. Imagine I'm trying to communicate a concept to you, as I'm doing at the moment. What I have to do in order to do that is I use my brain. It's no bigger than any of yours, certainly smaller than some of the people's in this audience. I use my brain to have a sense of who you are. And this happens at both a conscious and a subconscious level. So before I communicate, I have an idea of who I'm communicating with. I choose what I say on the basis of that knowledge. And when I communicate with you, you're hearing my communication, and you have a sense of who I am, and also a sense of who you think that I think that you are. <laughs> we can only do this so many times. <laughs> and you use that to judge your response. So you make a response, which is part of the low bandwidth communication. I absorb that, assimilate, and make a further response. And this is a beautiful dance in practice, the way two humans communicate with each other to get ideas across, understanding who each other is at the same time as they understand the ideas. When it goes well, it's wonderful. When it goes badly, we end up swearing at each other. And we typically end up swearing at each other because we slightly misunderstand each other. If you totally misunderstand someone, it doesn't tend to bother you. It's only when you slightly misunderstand each other that you end up swearing. Now, this has an effect that if we're told of other intelligences, we tend to do something to them. Our intelligence is embodied, so we naturally think that other intelligences must be embodied. And there's a wonderful example of this here in the painting on the Sistine Chapel. When you read what the Bible says about the notion of God, it describes an intelligence that is beyond our imagining, that it's omniscient, that has, it's omnipotent. It has all these great powers. And yet, when we come to represent it, we choose to draw a bloke with a beard, as if that's our best representation of an unimaginable intelligence. And this is coming about because we like to embody intelligences, because we're used to engaging with other embodied intelligences. But the intelligence we have created is not embodied, and it is by no means a bloke with a beard, and it does not operate in the same way our intelligence operates. That's the first difference between the machine and us. It's inability, well, our inability to communicate. But look at these six words. According to Shannon, these words have 72 bits of information. And yet, to understand the meaning of these words, it's an apocryphal six-word novel by Ernest Hemingway, you have to understand what it means to be human. You have to understand what it means for a potential life to have existed and that to have not come about, and what that means to an individual. So the core indivisible aspect of humanity is having access to these two things, that limited ability to compute and the vulnerabilities that are associated with our state. These cannot be taken from us by the machine because the machine can never experience these in the same way. So when it comes to consequential decisions about other human beings, we will always want those decisions to be made by entities that see and, more importantly, feel the world in the same way we do. Now, that's not to say that the machine can't help. Those pilots, those test pilots who originally flew, or like Amelia Earhart, flew the aircraft by being directly attached to the control services, they were quite happy in the end to be assisted by the machine in flying spacecraft that they would not be capable of controlling without the assistance of the machine. And what we should be looking to do is integrate the machine in that way, as a support for our humanity, rather than the replacement for it. 
However, we face very large challenges with that. So this stone tablet is from about 2500 BC. It's from Mesopotamia, and if I remember correctly, it records crop sales. What we have in modern society is a group of people that manage our society on our behalf, the equivalent of the modern managing of crop sales or administering legal, legal systems or performing civil administrations that descend from the very first people who learnt to read and write. This is cuneiform, the first form of writing. That group of people, the scribes, are the ones that support us in our society today in administering the things we do. And yet, as we introduce the computer, we're undermining that group. We're preventing our professions from administering things because their ability to access and control the machine is far less than their ability to access and control historic forms of writing. In the UK, we just had an enormous scandal called the Horizon Scandal that basically comes about when an accounting system is replaced by a computerized accounting system. So this isn't new or unique to AI. It's about replacing one information infrastructure with another. If we look at Thomas Kuhn, who wrote about the structure of scientific revolutions and gave us the common usage of the word paradigm, which in his sense meant a shift in scientific paradigm, like the quantum paradigm we heard about yesterday, a paradigm shift in our understanding of physics. Kuhn talks about how paradigms are defined by the current information structure. In his case, he refers to textbooks. Textbooks as the defining, defining uh, mode of information storage for the paradigm. Now, we've moved away from that. We've moved to the computer. But as we build that, we're building machines that few of us understand. We're building simulations, for example, in COVID, that even the designer of the simulation doesn't have a good understanding of, because they can't remember everything they coded in there. This phenomenon is known as intellectual debt. And it's not one of the computer taking over because it's sentient. It's one of the computer doing things we don't understand because we've built a system that is more complex than we understand. Going back to culture, this to me represents the condition that many of us are in as scientists. This is Blake's image of Newton. And what he's trying to represent here, and he knew from engravings the Sistine Chapel, and I don't think the similarity between Newton's face and Adam's face in that first image is a coincidence. What Blake is representing for us is the obsession human beings have when they focus their intelligence on solving a problem. On that obsession that many of the scientists will know in the audience, where you have a geometric issue you're trying to solve. You've reduced the world into numbers, into measures, in the way that Lord Kelvin told us to do. And you are reasoning about the world through those measures, and you are changing the world. Now, you might think that Blake is celebrating Newton here. He is not. Blake is highlighting that Newton is in a trance, as represented by his underwater position. But that trance is ignoring the sea life around him. It's like he's in a sleep. Indeed, the image is taken from Abijah, who is on the right here, one of Michelangelo's ancestors of Christ, who at the time was seen to be sleeping. He's taken that specifically because he's saying that the reductionist approach to dealing with the world causes us to miss the complexity of the world around us. So although I'm an engineer and I've lived my life according to Lord Kelvin's maxim that what cannot be measured cannot be improved, what Blake is telling us is there is more complexity to the world and more diversity to the world than what we can simply measure. When we communicate with each other, we cannot communicate with base truths. We cannot communicate by going from first principles and logic. We cannot explain beauty from first principles or obscenity from first principles. We also cannot explain intelligence from first principles. Intelligence is not rankable. The notion of artificial general intelligence is absurd because artificial general intelligence is not definable. The notion of a singularity is absurd. 
Because what we know is just like beauty can take different forms, so intelligence can take different forms. And each of those forms is more or less appropriate for different circumstances. Unless I tell you the circumstance, I cannot rank different approaches to the problem. So we need to move away from such crass terms. Terms that in the past, general intelligence itself emerged from the eugenics movement as a term. We need to move away from crass terms and realize that our intelligence is simply what defines us. It's specific to us and our circumstances, our vulnerabilities and our limitations. And the way we communicate with each other is we stand in front of an audience in a hockey system and we talk to them about books and paintings and philosophical ideas in a hope that you can share the same sense that I have of these things. None of these things is measurable. None of these things is quantifiable in that way, but it does not make them any less worthy. What have we built? This is a beautiful computer. It's built by someone called Phil, uh, Bill Phillips in the 1940s, and it's an analog computer. It's an analog computer that Bill built to simulate the British economy. Each tank represents an amount of money in different parts of the government. If I remember well, the top tank is the UK Treasury. And as you move valves, water flows in the same way money flows. So Bill was trying to represent the economy through an analogy. And that, of course, is the origin of the term analog computer. They were computers that computed through analogy, just as water flows, money flows. Very often, that analogy was electricity, but it was also often mechanical. The digital re computer has replaced these analog computers. But in effect, the new thing we have built is what I think of as a human analog machine. The confusion people have is you're thinking about, oh, this is an AI, so it must always be correct, as David had with HAL 9000. It must be all-knowing. It's a computer. It's a digital computer. It can't make mistakes. Only it can make mistakes if we've taught it to compute in the same way that we think. In other words, we've given it all the text we've ever written, and we've asked it, could you please reconstruct this text? And in order to do that, it's had to rediscover these fundamental concepts that we can't quantify, these qualitative concepts, and saw them inside its electronic brain, and therefore it is able to talk to us in the way that is similar to the way that we are talking to each other. But since all of those measures are flawed, all of those measures are particular to us and our journey through our evolutionary journey, of course it starts making the same kind of mistakes that human beings make when it does that. So I think of the new generation of large language models and models based on looking at human content as human analog machines or HAMs. Don't think of them as digital computers. But they offer massive opportunities. Because for the first time, we are able to converse with a computer. That means that instead of going directly to the digital computer and having to learn to be a software engineer, we can talk to the ham. We can talk to the human analog machine and ask it questions about what the digital computer is doing. This is extraordinary. It's akin to the development of the printing press. The democratization of writing, where every one of you in this room knows how to read and write. And the reason you know how to do that is because writing stopped being the preserve of the scribes and became accessible to everyone. The human analog machine offers the same possibility, but please don't think of it as a replacement for the digital computer. It's an interface to the digital computer. One that I hope will give us all access to that information infrastructure. I think that's an extraordinary future, but it's got an enormous number of perils with it. Because the interaction between us and the human analog machine is subject to manipulation. Just as social media has already used manipulation through understanding how humans behave by looking at vast quantities of our data rather than understanding us individually, we will be able to develop human analog machines 
that are persuasive or talkative in ways that are undermining our humanity. Even if we actively don't do that, but we just end up using these machines, there's a particular challenge we face, and the challenge arises from this. Our hippocampus is responsible for navigation. It fires in sympathy with our prefrontal cortex when we're doing planning or imagining or thinking through a problem. And one of the things we can see happening around us everywhere is with the increasing use of GPS, we are losing our ability to navigate sensibly. So what you can look forward to if we use this technology in an unthinking way is the equivalent of a doctor or a lawyer driving into a harbor because they lost all sense of their role and were just following what the human analog machine said, just as this tourist followed simply what the GPS said. We are in real danger of sleepwalking into a position where we undermine our capabilities. This is two panels alongside Michelangelo's original picture. It depicts the fall, the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. What it represents to us is this moment of anguish as they leave paradise. And that's the Christian tradition of what happened here. But in other traditions, other traditions say that this was the moment that we became aware, that we gained free will, that we were no longer being constrained by a God, that we had to make our own decisions and suffer the consequence of them. What some are proposing with AI is a return to the Garden of Eden, a return to this benevolent autocracy that I suspect never existed, where we are all responsive to the machine. For me, the moment of this creation, the moment where our dreams sometimes fail to become reality, is the definition of the human condition. And it's represented here by Blake with his rendering of the creation of Adam where you see an expression of anguish on Adam's face. Adam is bound like Prometheus was bound to the rock. This is more like Prometheus having his liver plucked out than the creation. And the reason that Blake felt that was the case is because he believed the moment at which we were made material was the moment at which the trouble started. As we interacted with the earth and our dreams failed to become reality, that was the moment at which we started to suffer pain. I believe that interaction between our dreams and reality and the complexity of the world around us is actually what defines us as human beings. We are blessed with the ability to dream and imagine, cursed with the fact that our plans fail to carry out in practice, but blessed with an optimism that we're happy to carry out the process all over again. Now, how does this relate to our environment? One of the troubles we face and one of the perils we face is the international mass anthropomorphization of this technology. People talking about AGI as if we are creating a being. We are being lulled into this falsehood by very large companies and very intelligent people. That is a misrepresentation of this intelligence. It is operating at millions of times faster than we can communicate. To give you a sense of that difference, I want to introduce something to you that is offering, operating millions of times slower. This is roughly the rate of communication in nanobits, 100 nanobits, between two human beings when we give birth. That's how much information is passing to the next generation. Our ecology all around us is based on information transfer across generations that is as slow in comparison to us as we are slow in comparison to the computer. So when it comes to imagining what it feels for the computer to look like, if a computer can feel, to be looking at us, it feels the same as us looking at our ecology, at our planet, and thinking, my goodness, this squirrel hasn't evolved in a while. What's going on there? What's going on? is an information propagation process that plays out over millions of years, which we are disrupting in decades and centuries 
and suffering the consequences as our planet struggles to respond. What we risk with the computer is the same problem. Because the real challenge is, while the computer is faster than us, and the ecology is slower than us, the complexity sits all with the ecology, then us, then the machine. They may have speed on their side, but the complexity and diversity and interest is firstly with us and then with the ecology that surrounds us. And that is because although the ecology has been slow, it has been doing this for nearly four billion years across many billions of different species, many of which don't exist with us today. So the idea that the computer takes over, when you think of analogies that are helpful for understanding the perils of that, please think of analogies that are equivalent to ecological damage, poisoning, or pollution. Because the perils we face from the machine are similar. It's not that it wishes us ill, just as we didn't really wish our ecology ill. We just thought we were doing the right thing. But because we compute on a different time frame, again, making a mockery of the idea of an artificial general intelligence, because we compute on a different time frame to our ecology, we have severely damaged it. And the computer has the same potential to do the same to us. Now, I don't want to end on a low note. I want to end on a positive. You might feel that it's difficult for us to make the sort of change we need that it's difficult for us to go forward. I think that the only answer is confident optimism in human beings. But what we first of all have to do is rally around cultural ideas that move away from the simplistic technobabble we are hearing from some of the dominant forces in our society and start to focus on what we care about as humans and what we would like to emphasize and preserve, not what we would like to replace through approaches that, while they've achieved wonderful things, and we should continue to allow them to achieve wonderful things, should never be allowed to dominate us. So if you like these ideas, you don't have to buy the book, because I've explained them all to you now. <laughs> but they are in the book, out on that way up. <laughs> they are in the book, out on the 6th of June. Thank you very much. Thank you.